Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third in the series of webinars about rising to the challenge. What will it take to decarbonise transport? And this morning, we're focusing on the role of localism, and that's localism in its broadest sense, so, you know, local leaders, local organisations, and how can that local emphasis ensure a fair and just transition to net zero and driving decarbonisation? So we've got a, a host of, of fantastic um, speakers this morning um, and you'll be hearing from them all shortly. Um, I would remind you that this session is going to be recorded. Indeed, some of you may have uh, watched the recordings of the first two webinars. Um, and uh, also, um, just to remind you that there will be an opportunity uh, to put your questions um, to, to the panel members later in the session. So do think of your questions and add them to the Q&A as we go along. So without more ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Claire Haig, who many of you will know. She's the Chief Executive of Greener Transport Solutions, and she'll tell you a bit more about the event this morning. Thank you. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Hilary. Um, yes, and good morning, everyone. and Welcome to the third and final in a series of webinars that will culminate in the publication of a manifesto for decarbonising transport. Um, I'd like to sincerely thanks, thank Adelshaw Goddard for kindly sponsoring the series, um, the Foundation for Integrated Transport for providing grant funding to support the development of the manifesto, and the Greener Transport Council, without whose wise counsel and support none of this would be happening. The purpose of the Rising to the Challenge series is to focus attention on what is needed to decarbonise transport. In our first webinar, we looked at the changes needed to our wider economy. Transport is a derived demand, so we can, and is intricately bound up with every aspect of our lives. So we cannot consider the decarbonisation of transport without looking at it in the whole ecosystem of the wider economy. Everything we consume has transport in it, and high transport emissions are in part a reflection of the fact that we are consuming too much stuff. It doesn't help that historically um, we have focused in policy terms primarily on reducing our territorial emissions and have conveniently pushed our consumption emissions under the, under the carpet, um, effectively offshoring them in all the products that we import. At our second session, we looked in more detail at government policy in encouraging people to make lower carbon travel choices. We reflected that despite all the hard work and effort, not much progress had been made. Um, Greg Archer referred to Einstein's definition of insanity, um, which is, um, as we all know, making the same mistakes over and over again and expecting different results. Um, since 1990, we have been stuck in the same groove, like a broken record, only ever making small incremental improvements, only to see these changes, these improvements um, eroded, these efficiency gains eroded by the trend to larger vehicles, for example, or rising demand for car and van travel. Whilst clean vehicle technologies have absolutely progressed to the point that um, net zero is perfectly achievable, the problem is that we've run out of time. 60% of fuel supply and half of, surface, half of the surface transport decarbonisation required by 2050 needs to have happened in this decade if we are to remain on track. We've simply left it too late to rely on electrification alone. We need to reduce the sheer volume of traffic on our roads. But this is a massive ask. Car dependency has been built into our lives since the 1950s. The scale of change needed will be uncomfortable for the public and challenging for politicians. It's not surprising, therefore, that um, policy for the past 30 years has been underpinned by the assumption that we can continue our existing travel behaviour just with cleaner technologies, a message that was indeed echoed in the forward to the Transport Decarbonisation Plan. So what is going to break us out of this self-defeating pattern? To quote Einstein again, we cannot solve our most difficult and intractable problems from the, make the same mindset that created them in the first place. The urgency of less than a decade means that only transformational change is going to get us onto a safe tra emissions trajectory in time. In the future we choose, architect of the 2000, her book, 
the architect of the um, 2015 Paris Agreement, Christiana Fugueras, and her co-author Tom Rivet Karnak, talk about the need for, for the, the, to, to open the space for that. If we're going to open the space for the transformation needed, we're going to need to change how we think and fundamentally who we perceive ourselves to be. This will require a whole new collaborative approach. We live in a competitive and at times adversarial culture, but to make progress on climate change, we need to understand difficulties from as many perspectives as possible, businesses, consumers, politicians, and we need to develop empathy. In our first session, Lord Deben um, made the point that we do need to praise government when it gets things right, whilst holding its feet to the fire when it doesn't. Um, he says that campaigners who continually berate the government for what it hasn't done, and I for one stand guilty as charged, don't actually help encourage the kind of policy changes we need. Perhaps we should try harder to understand what it's like to sit at a desk in Marsham Street where you're up against these massive challenges on a daily basis. To have got politicians, even to the point of starting to talk about making public transport, walking and cycling the natural first choice, is a quantum leap from where we once were. Politicians can only lead if people are willing to follow. I and mean, one of the central questions is how do we bring about the changes that we need in a democracy? Rebecca Willis, in her book, um, Too Hot to Handle, Dem The Democratic Challenge of Climate Change, makes the case for a more deliberative model of democracy um, and for appealing to the heart as well as to the head. Um, it's clear that the Climate Assembly UK has shown that deliberative democracy can deliver results. And there is a growing body of opinion that people should be at the heart of, of designing policy to tackle the climate crisis. And today we will be hearing from IPPR whose landmark report um, from, from the Environmental Justice Commission makes the case for a new social contract. One of the biggest challenges that we face is that carbon is not priced properly. Policies to address such market failures should be at the heart of climate policy and wherever possible, external costs should be internalized. However, crucially, this must be achieved whilst ensuring a fair and just transition to net zero. What sort of mitigation measures need to be in place to prevent environmental taxes from becoming regressive? I mean, this will apply not just to transport, but to other areas such as heating. Do we need to start considering proposals, for example, for a proportional climate change allowance? One of the themes that's come up in previous seminars is that much more support should be given to local authorities, as it is at the local level that much of decarbonisation needs to be delivered. And indeed, decarbonisation strategy requires the overcoming of silos of government and coordination of different aspects of policy is indeed easier at the local level. However, the disjointed and fragmented nature of devolution means that too often local leaders are reliant on ad hoc, short-term, project-based funding and lack the powers and resources to plan and invest on an integrated long-term basis. So today we will discuss what more is needed locally. How should local funding and governance be reformed to ensure that local leaders are equipped and supported to deliver the changes that are needed? We certainly need a wholesale form of appraisal um, I mean, as we know, existing methods tend are biased the, towards the most easy appraised outcomes, such as faster journeys, rather than the harder to achieve, um, harder to, to measure objectives, such as integrating better transport, housing, jobs, etc. And we need to move beyond the narrow frameworks of cost benefit analysis. Climate change has got to be framed in terms of the management of immense risk. Um, in his book, Values, Mark Carney illustrates beautifully, I think, how valuations and the way we measure things can lead us astray. Um, in comparing the valuations of Amazon and the Amazon region, he points out that Amazon's 1.3 trillion equity valuation reflects the market's judgment 
that the company will be very profitable for a long time. In contrast, it is only once the rainforest is cleared and a cattle herd or soil plantation is, plant, is placed on the newly opened land that the Amazon region begins to have a market value. The cost to the climate and biodiversity of destroying the rainforest appear on no ledger. <laughs> there is no doubt that the scale of change needed is huge and can feel overwhelming. Um, it, it came up one of the points that our, our last session that the research has conclusively shown that one of the actually the biggest obstacle um, to people changing their behavior is thinking that what they do won't make any difference. And on a bad day, we can all feel like that. Um, my colleague and fellow um, Greener Transport Council member, Professor Glenn Lyons, likes to remind us of, of the old adage, change in the short term often happens slower than we hope, but then in the longer term can happen faster than we could have dreamt possible. Glenn takes huge comfort from the increase in mobilization of, of, of public concern since Greta Thunberg appeared on the scene. Anyway, I'd like to end with a final quote from Christiana Fogaris and Tom Reed at Karnak. They say, we want you to know two things. First, even at this late hour, we still have a choice about our future, and therefore every action we take from this moment forward counts. Second, we are capable of making the right choices about our destiny. We are not doomed to a devastating future, and humanity is not flawed and incapable of responding to big problems if we act. So um, I've, uh, that's, that's the end of my introductory remarks. I, I want to thank you all very much for joining this final webinar um, in our Rising to this Challenge series, and I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Claire, for a really thought provoking introduce, introduction to, to the webinar. I was interested that um, you, you uh, had a couple of quotes from Einstein and anyone that's been listening to Radio 4 recently might know that Einstein had a very clever and influential wife as well. And I think that I think it, it's, it's really good that we've got a number of women speaking today uh, uh, as well. Um, so I believe now that um, ah, right, we were going to hand over to Jamie Driscoll, I think he hasn't, ah, oh, here he is. Perfect timing. Um, good, good morning, Jamie. Jamie's the uh, North of Tyne Mayor, and you're going to give us a, an opening speech talking about the transport decarbonisation plan in the uh, context of and the role of localism. So thanks very much, Jamie. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Hilary. Um, good timing, I think. I've just been talking about um, low carbon investment with, with somebody else. Um, Greener transport. It's funny when we talk about greener transport. Um, for me, it's part and parcel of better transport anyway. A lot of the approaches that people look at when they're talking about greener transport are changing internal combustion engines for electric motors. And, and all that, that certainly has a, a carbon reduction effect. Um, when people are basically going to still be sitting inside um, a vehicle in a traffic jam i'm not sure it's going to get us exactly where we want you know the, the current aspirations towards better transport um for a lot of people are sitting in a traffic jam in a car with leather seats instead of fabric seats and if we're going to start to look at moving people instead of moving vehicles we do need to be thinking about these things differently if we look at the the basic thermodynamics of it you know typical car 1500 1600 kilos typical person um 75 kilos possibly a bit more after 18 months of lockdown but every time you go somewhere you end up taking with you uh, a big lump of steel that weighs 20 times you do and the thermodynamics of that don't add up so we've got to be looking at this differently in terms of modal shift in particular uh, one of the things that is today is about is we've been looking at um the Department of Transport's decarbonising transport um, approach plan document. Um, so I'll briefly touch on a few things in there. One of the things they're talking about is by 2040 ending um, tailpipe emissions, zero tailpipe emissions as a target. So 
Um, I mean, let's take this in good faith. I know government targets aren't necessarily always reliable, um, but, but we'll take that in good faith. So they're saying one of the things I want to do is blend 10% ethanol in. Um, well, you've probably read the news recently that world wheat prices are soaring with increasing climate damage and it is now quite clear that this is not hypothetical it's not something that's going to happen in the future it is now then the idea of using prime arable land for producing food for cars basically um, is not going to work when we're seeing as we see the climate emergency start to bite when we see hundreds of millions billions of people displaced due to climate damage so I'm not sure ethanol is the future. Um, we're seeing a lot of talk in that document about blue hydrogen. Um, and many of you, um, I hope, have, have seen reference to I actually read the full report in Energy Sciences and Engineering, uh, a peer-reviewed journal talking about the actual emissions from blue hydrogen. And it's important to blue hydrogen, uh, for those who don't know, it's made by getting Standard fossil fuel hydrogen, um, methane, methane, uh, quick chemistry lesson here, CH4, one carbon atom, four hydrogen atoms. You put it in very, very hot steam and it breaks down and you separate it off. The problem is it uses a lot of energy to do that. And there's leakage in the system. They reckon about 3% of the, the methane leaks out overall over the lifespan of that. Uh, the problem is, of course, that methane is um, normally about 86 times worse a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So blue hydrogen produces more emissions than if you just burned oil. Um, and uh, Chris Jackson, who was the chair of the industry body lobbying for blue hydrogen, resigned saying that the whole thing was a, a sham uh, and full of dishonesty. Um, so if we're going to go to hydrogen, we have to decarbonize the grid and make green hydrogen. And let's be honest, if we're going to um, have everybody in an electric vehicle and if we're going to have electric HGVs and electric um, light goods vehicles, um, which we do need, um, then that's of no benefit whatsoever if we're still generating electricity from fossil fuels. All we're doing is shifting the emissions from the tailpipe to the chimney of the power station. So we do need a fully decarbonized electricity grid and that is where we're going. And, uh, and in the report, um, the um, uh, rising to the challenge, I think uh, the, the title of the report, I'm <laughs> doing this from memory, um, it was talking about the need for decarbonisation to involve changes to the wider economy. Um, in the DFT's document, um, it was, we'll have world-class cycling and walking by 2040. My comment on that is why wait? Um, you know, um, walking does not require any technological solutions or innovation. We've just got to kind of crack on with that. If we look at the barriers, currently, a lot of it is about investment in street furniture. And there's a need for that. And the reason a lot of people don't ride bikes um, to and from places is because they're worried that they're going to be nicked or vandalised. So, yeah, better security, absolutely. Um, but another reason for people not to go to work using active travel um, is we are humans, we get hot, we get sweaty. Um, I can I can do that, our only office has showers in, it's lovely, um, but we are in a sort of a premium office building when I'm not working at home. Um, but if you're a, a shop assistant in Greg's, you know, you don't really want to be sort of standing there with all your colleagues doing that because you've ran in and there's no shower. Um, so these are the sort of things we need to be seriously thinking about investing. Buses um, currently unviable financially. The funding for that needs to be not at risk to local authorities. It needs proper investment. The integrated rail plan, when we're talking about decarbonising transport in there, that was due out last November, I think, then December, then it's going to be January, then March, then July, and it's going to come out at some point in the future. Um, it, it's been written by Samuel Beckett, I think. It's like waiting for Godot. Um, but if it was good news, it would have been leaked. So I think what we're going to see is there's not going to be the investment in it. When we look at things like Jet Zero, lovely catchphrase. Um, and uh, absolutely, we need to be reducing the carbon emissions coming from air, air, air travel. But we also need to be thinking, why are we filling up with freight and, and importing vegetables from places around the world and we can grow vegetables perfectly well here um, and uh, and actually just spend uh, well just just connect the dots there and say that this is not viable if we were to be paying for the climate damage done by those vegetables we'd find they're a lot more expensive 
Um, but we also need to be thinking about the route to personal responsibility with a little bit of this. So I would be in favour of something like an air miles scheme where the, the security technology on air travel now is so high that you kind of know where everybody's gone. Um, so, well, let's just make it so the individual accumulates those miles and you go on a ramp so that, you know, once you've done more than a thousand miles, you're paying a greater tax and a greater tax and a greater tax again. We would accept as a basic premise, if you're driving down the road and you shunt into someone's car, it's your responsibility to pay for it. So we should extend that basic responsibility that if you're flying around the world and wrecking the planet, you have to pay for the damage. And I think it requires political leaders to step up for this. You know, I've got to be get briefly political on this. Um, in the just before the local elections earlier this year, um, we saw um, Andy Street, who's, a, who's a, a colleague of mine, who's a, who's a fellow Metro man, on a bike ride with our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Um, but the Prime Minister, in order to do this bike ride promoting sustainable travel, had got in a helicopter from London. I mean, frankly, that's obscene. When we talk about freight, HGV and LGV, we should be thinking about the consolidation of deliveries and end the myth of free delivery. There's no such thing as free delivery. Um, the damage done from these things going out all over the place. So yeah, there's any number of things. This is not a worked out position, but I would like to see someone do some work and say, why is it that you can have three delivery vans in the same day come and deliver something to your door? Um, and occasionally, actually, you can buy an order off an online retailer and two separate deliveries turn up for the thing. Do we actually really need these things in the next 24 hours very often? No, we don't. If we had to wait and go to the shops, as we did in the old days, um, you know, 10 years ago, um, we would just wait and we'd go to the shop and we'd do our shopping all in one go. We can do the same on there. The technology, the IT is there for doing this. Um, we need to get there. Um, and I think a lot of this was summed up in the 2021 budget, where I remember the, uh, the then new Chancellor of the Exchequer proudly announcing a billion pound for greener transport, all in favour of investment in greener transport. His very next sentence, uh, he ebulliently announced, and 27 billion for tarmac. The priorities are wrong. So what this, should this be like? Well, I was showing a, a journalist around our region recently, and we were in the electric leaf. And I said, oh, this is one of the few bus gates we've got, but it's in. Um, and we were approaching and I said, watch that bus. And it went off into the bus lane. The traffic light in our stream turned red, it turned green, the bus went straight through. That's the sort of investment we make if we want better transport. We need on-demand transport, particularly for, for rural areas. The, the idea of buses racing and competing to get the passengers and then there being no other bus for an hour um, is no good. Enhanced partnerships and time franchising will support that, but they need to be properly funded. I would like to see us get to mobility as a service where everything is on a smartphone. Um, and if you don't have a smartphone, it'll still work with a debit card. But um, this is right down to having car sensors, uh, sensors on the parking spaces in town, so you know it's booked. So if you do choose to drive, if that's the only option available for you, know, perhaps taking something very heavy, you're a uh, plumber with a van full of tools, and boom, you can book your space, no problem. So people aren't driving round and round trying to find it. Um, better public transport, on the, the, the rock up transport. So when you want to get there, you can just walk up, you can get on the bus, and you don't have to wait. A ticketing system for our railway system, where you're not penalised for not knowing a fortnight in advance where you're going. And find now, for someone like me, it's 235 quid to get to London. And then that's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So all of this can be integrated. The multimodal transport, the ability to take bikes or electric scooters on. There's, there's a lot of pilots, there's one in Newcastle now, um, for the, the scooters, but they're hanging around on the roads. That's all right. Um, but if I was going to be commuting, I wouldn't want to take the chance. You would want your own scooter. So the investment in cycle lanes has to be part of that. But these are a perfect last mile solutions and first mile solutions that can get to your, your mass transit system, to your, your bus, take the scooter on with you, get on the bus to do the, the bulk of the journey, do it the last bit. That also helps, by the way, keep it just a little bit healthier if you're doing a little bit more walking or cycling every day. Um, and, uh, and then we get to the point where if you can get to and from work or, or education without a car, if you can get your shopping done without needing a car, what do you really need a car for? Well, maybe going away for the weekend or something like that. Well, you've got car clubs for that. And um, later this week, um, 
uh, I'm doing a press with a local bus company and a local car club about them joining together, which is great. I'm a member of a car club. I don't have a car anymore. Uh, it works for me, but I'm not sort of a, a low income worker. I'm going to drop the kids off and then go and do a series of part time jobs. So we need a system that works for everybody. We do that. We can get 100,000 cars off the road uh, in, in the northeast. So longer term, what do we need? Well, we need better planning for neighborhood design. Um, I've heard phrase of 15 minute neighborhoods, 20 minute neighborhoods. I'm not really bothered about that five minutes, but that has definitely got to be the idea that we that we have what we need pretty much on our doorsteps. Um, we need better design for new estates so that actually buses can get through them and not windy ones that are optimizing the amount of houses you can get in. But I mean, that you can't get public transport in there um, in any sort of sustainable way. We need uh, to be building the public transport first in these places. And of course, we need better digital infrastructure so that we don't actually have to move around as much in the first place anyway. And this comes out of the question of money. Um, Keynes said anything we can actually do, we can afford. And that's, that's worth unpacking that. Um, he said, uh, I've got the quote here, actually, let me read it. Let us not submit to the vile doctrine of the 19th century that every enterprise must justify in itself pounds, shillings and pence of cash income. With a big programme carried out at a regulated pace, we can hope to keep employment good for many years to come. And, uh, and then he waxes lyrical about a new Jerusalem. But that's the problem, is it requires a willingness to challenge assumptions and special in in interests and the friction. Uh, for the game theorists amongst you, there's something called the Nash equilibrium. Um, and this is the idea that nobody will make a move unless incrementally they're better on every single scale. Um, and it requires, according to Nash, and he's right, um, people to be incentivized to do that. Incentive does not always necessarily mean paying people money. We were very successful at incentivizing people to not drink under the influence of alcohol and then you know, cause RTAs and deaths. What's the incentive for not drinking and driving? It's great, you can't, don't go to jail. Um, so just as I said earlier, if you bump into someone else's car with your car, you expect to pay. So let's actually incentivize a lot of these things by making the polluter pay. That said, the money is already out there. Where does the money come from? We started from the point of view of what would it cost to have a sustainable transport system? Transport isn't devolved to the north of China, don't have that. Um, but as transport, any system, any complex system can be stable at different levels. Um, any of the, the mathematicians or engineers amongst you will know that. So if, if you get a cut, it's stable like that and it's stable like that, but it's not stable on its side. So it's the same with a public transport system. If you get a lot of people on it and get a critical mass, then people start giving up their cars and they use public transport by default and the money is there. It costs £4,600 a year on average to own and run a car. People are already paying a fortune for their transport and a lot of people are in transport poverty. By making public transport so good at that higher level, it does start to become stable. And you can put a cross subsidy in particular then to those routes that build the network, but perhaps aren't stable on their own because left to the market, bus companies will run the profitable routes and not the other routes. And that's understandable from their perspective, but it's a failure from a system perspective. Yes, we need these people to be profitable. We need business to be profitable. Otherwise, they can't reinvest. But the question is profit for what and for whom? If it's extraction to go in Wall Street finance bubbles, no, I'm opposed to it. If it's profit in order to train better workers, in order to invest in better kit, then yes, absolutely, that's what we need. So one of the questions on today is about devolved transport settlements um we've been given a sort of a headline allocation of around 600 million pounds although it might turn out that once you take away the first year of the transport um uh the tcf funding um you take away the money that we're already getting for potholes across the region all of this then it might actually turn out to be about 600 million is only 200 million so you always got to be careful of, of headline figures um but there's a lot of money we're spending as a country already the um, health costs of devolution are going to be 49.9 billion a year by 2050. So on a per capita basis, that's 1,650 million pounds, 1.65 billion in the Northeast transport area every year. Our transport budget is 160 million, tenth of that. If we were to just put some of that money into a better transport system, it would hit our net zero targets. It would pay 
up front for a reduction in health problems down the line. We'd have a healthier, more productive population. We'd have a happier population and it wouldn't cost any more money. That's the approach we've got to take. So when we talk about wanting a, a London style transport system, and I appreciate there's issues in London as well, but a London trans transport system around the UK, particularly the big city regions like mine, uh, but also everywhere else, that's part of what we've got to do. And it's the local and devolved authorities that make, made all of the running in terms of decarbonisation, in terms of a lot of these initiatives. Local authorities have got a fantastic speed of delivery. Um, North of Tyne combined authority overall. Um, I've been there for two years, four months. Um, should have 700 jobs in the pipelines, 4,200. We've got our Green New Deal. We're investing in offshore wind, a whole range of things. Um, we've got green finance options that we're looking at. Um, and the economic benefits of this are that it pays for itself. So um, that's a bit of a whistle stop to it because I could talk at length about all these things. But I think I'll leave uh, a lot to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jamie. A really, another really thought-provoking uh, introduction. And, and I'm pleased to hear that you're able to stay for the question and answer session because we've already got a number of interesting questions coming in around the uh, relationship, particularly between the cost of, uh, of travel and what we can do through the planning policy, um, which brings us very neatly on to our next um, speaker and the first of our panel members, um, Victoria Hills, who is Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute. So I'll hand over to you now, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilary. And um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how long I've got, but I'm working on the basis of no more than five minutes. Is that right? Five minutes. Super, so I'm... Thank you. Perfect. I'll just give some uh, sort of headline um, comments, if you like, observations on what we've heard uh, from Mayor Driscoll. Um, excellent to hear. Um, speaking very uh, sensibly, but perhaps passionately on the need for better planning as well. And you know, what a week to be having this opportunity to come and speak to all of you. Thank you very much, because if we believe what we've been reading in national media over the weekend, this could be the week that we finally get a response to the government's white paper planning for a better future. Um, I appreciate I'm mainly speaking with um, transport experts here, practitioners and academics. So just to recap, on the 6th of August 2020, the government consulted on a new white paper for planning, major, major reform on the table. And uh, this, of course, will have significant implications for how we plan transport, how we do transport going forward. And uh, fast forward just over a year, um, we believe that we may now have a response from government as to what that looks like in the run up to a bill being laid later in the year. And, um, and, and we're, we're all very much uh, looking forward to that because it will provide, I think, a real opportunity. Um, we don't know what's gonna be in that response, but we do know that the importance of the local plan was proposed very much to be beefed up in that planning reform. And that's really important because if we're thinking about how to really impact transport and achieve net zero development it really starts with where you put the development in the first place um, and in in putting it in the most sustainable locations by that we mean areas that people can access via public transport um, and also how you design it so that you provide opportunities for people to engage in active transport particularly walking which we know um, the pandemic has provided such an opportunity for people to re-engage with their passion for walking. You know, if you went back sort of 50 years, it wouldn't be that unusual for people to walk three, four miles a day to get places. In a lockdown, people uh, rekindled that passion with walking about because, let's face it, there wasn't too much else to do with everything closed. Um, and this provided an opportunity for people to re-engage with their local community, um, see what was going on in the local area and discover that they could get to places without just jumping in a default mode, which may or may not have been um, the, the car. So we do think there's an opportunity here um, to uh, strengthen the role of the place through the local plan in particular. But then it will be on all of us to make sure that we work hard as professionals to join that across between the transport profession and the planning profession um, and that we knit that together uh, locally um, so that we don't have plans working in silos um, that it's very much joined together. Now, as a professional institute, also a learning society, 
We published a whole report on net zero transport earlier in the year. I'll try and share that in, in the link shortly for the delegates here. Um, but really a pathway to decarb. Well, when I was writing my notes, um, not to be confused with taking carbs out of your diet. This is about decarbonisation, of course, um, and really prioritising opportunities and um, planning in a low or zero carbon way or even carbon positive uh, way. Um, and uh, by that, I mean putting back to the put, putting back to the grid, um, but really enabling in this context, enabling active travel, really giving people choices and just on that in terms of sort of willing hearts and minds. I think um, you know, the people who perhaps aren't necessarily on the panel today are the kind of younger uh, professionals, advocates, um, the, and, and perhaps in some cases brighter than, than many of us, who actually don't need convincing at all. Um, they're less likely to own a car, they're more likely to uh, want to do active things, and they are uh, living in some cases much healthier lifestyles than us, probably majority of them vegan already, and um, certainly my experience of um, sort of late teenagers, low 20 year olds is you, you haven't got to work too hard to win hearts and minds there. So if they are the solution, we need to get them into bright careers in transport planning and town planning. And we need to get them into positions of power, um, whether that be through the local councils or whether that be um, in, in, in governments uh, or, or in local governments. Uh, very important. And so one of the things perhaps I will say that others may not have on their notes is diversity. Um, if we're going to win uh, on net zero, we've got to broaden in the entrance routes to people getting involved in practice and policy and decisions. And part of that key brings in a broader diversity of um, people into the conversation um, and actually getting on and delivering solutions real time. Um, so often, um, you know, I, I try and decline being involved in all male panels, but I have to say in this uh, on this occasion, it's really important um, to, for me to have the opportunity to make these points because I'm probably the only town planner on on the whole morning. Um, and so if there's one passing point I would leave to all of you uh, in the mix of everything else you're going to hear, it's about diversity and let's bring more people in to um, solutions, but also delivery. Um, because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if, if, you're, if, if, if you're not aware of this already. We, we don't have to work too hard on those hearts and minds. They, they want to live in this future nirvana that we all want to achieve. And it is there generally for um, the, the taking. If we can all work together, I think we can achieve great things. Thank you for letting me go first. I think that's my five minutes. Thanks very much indeed, Victoria, and, and really important, as you say, to hear the voice of a planner and absolutely diversity is, is, is essential um, in this area. We've got some good questions coming in, which I'll pick up um, later on, but particularly somebody's raised the issue about walking and the importance of, of making that possible and, and easy for people. So hopefully we'll pick that, late, pick that up later on in our discussion. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, the, the next um, panel member, Martin Tugwell, who is Chief Executive of Transport for the North. Martin. Thanks, Hilary. Good morning, everybody. And uh, in some ways, it's quite a nice segue to to be the next in line after uh, talk, listening to Victoria there. Um, because I think the thing that she makes about uh, how this plays out for place and how it plays out for people, individuals, uh, and the diverse nature of those individuals that make our communities is absolutely fundamental here. And it's one of the reasons why, as Transport for the North, uh, we're committed to looking beyond just the traditional commute to work. Too much uh, of our professional thinking, I think, is dominated by the focus on how do we get people to and from work. One of the pieces of work that we're doing, uh, we published recently, was actually looking at the role of the visitor economy uh, in, in the North. Um, and it highlighted that many of the challenges our visitors face are exactly the same challenges that our residents in rural and, and less populated areas face. So it provides an evidence base as to what is it that we need to do moving forward. Further work around the transport-related social exclusion, the health and well-being will also be important in shaping uh, our work moving forward. Because, again, we've touched on it a little bit today already, um, but don't let's underestimate the scope and the ability for us to change the way things happen. We've seen through the pandemic 
uh, different things, uh, different ways of doing things. Uh, we've seen businesses provide access to their services in different ways. We as consumers have made greater use of digital connectivity to get access to some of those services ourselves. What it tells me is there is an opportunity to repurpose our town centres, our urban areas. There's an opportunity to do things which actually allow us to support more sustainable patterns of growth moving forward. It's also highlighted, though, the pandemic, the importance of freight and logistics. And when we're talking about decarbonisation, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that that is one of the most polluting parts of the transport sector. It's also uh, an area where we need to, we must think in terms of supply chains. It's not as simplistic as saying we need to transfer all the freight from road onto rail. Freight and logistics works in terms of supply chains. And in some ways, there's a challenge there for us when we're talking about personal journeys, because most personal journeys are also a systems approach. It's not exclusively one mode over the other. It's about system of modes. So in terms of looking forward, we very much need to look beyond transport. We need to look in terms of what are we trying to achieve as outcomes? And it's one of the reasons why we've uh, spent time developing future travel scenarios, building on some of the work that Professor Glenn Lyons has done in the past, um, but also applying that to the North and coming up with the evidence-based approach, which actually tells us the scale of the challenge that we face. Because not only is it about getting to net zero quickly, but it's doing it in a way that doesn't burn through our carbon budget as quickly as we currently are. And therein lies a further challenge. A further point for us to think about as we move forward is the relative impact of cost. And we saw in the transport decarbonisation plan from government highlighting that in relative terms, motoring costs have gone down by 20% in recent years. Buses have gone up by 40% and, car and uh, trains have gone up by 20%. It highlights the importance of price as a choice or a determinant of choice moving forward. So how do we overcome some of this? Well, at Transport for the North, we're certainly looking at how we can support our partners, people like Mayor Driscoll, in terms of delivering their agenda at the local level. That means focusing on outcomes, thinking about what do we need to achieve, understanding the scale of the problem, and then focusing on what does transport need to do to support and deliver those outcomes. Because as I said, it's not just transport solution to a transport problem, it is a whole systems approach. Moving forward, we've recently consulted on our decarbonisation strategy and we'll be publishing the final version of that later this year. We've already seen the department looking at the subnational transport bodies like TFN as being prime leaders working to support the role of local authorities in actually delivering. We'll be updating and reviewing our independent economic review because we've seen su substantial changes in terms of the way the business and the economy moves and we need to be fleet of foot in responding to those. And all of that will then feed into a revision of the strategic transport plan, which we'll start work on next year and set the framework for the next 20, 30 years. Overarching all of that is our commitment to continue to move forward the Northern Transport Charter, putting the user at the heart of our system, developing the investment pipeline with our partners and then making sure it gets delivered and doing that within a financial framework that's set by government so that we can work genuinely to look across programs to deliver outcomes that are place-based. And if I might add to our lexicon of, um, uh, of quotes this morning, I'm often struck by Robert Kennedy, who reflected that um, GDP, GVA, measures a lot of things. In fact, it measures everything except that which makes the whole life worthwhile. And I think if we turn and focus on outcomes, social factors, environmental factors, as well as the economy, then we will deliver a transport system fit for the future. Thanks very much, Hilary. Thanks very much, Martin. And um, I'm interested that you you picked out the um, uh, that that quote about relative costs because that that certainly jumped out uh, to me from the uh, from the decarbonising transport paper. Um, okay, we will move on now to Henry Morrison, who is um, director of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. Hello, Henry. Thank you, Hilary, and it's great to uh, follow uh, Martin, uh, an esteemed colleague here in the north of England, uh, who, who's just joined Transport of the North, and to also be alongside 
the other great panelists and, and obviously Jamie this morning whose whose contribution we're also responding to. Um, I think I really wanted to focus on some of the the barriers in policy terms to effectively decarbonizing. Um, and I think that really comes back to the point around how centralized transport decision making and funding is in this country and what that prevents us doing. So we've talked a lot now about the relative costs of transport and Martin's very well outlined what those are. Um, and we need to find different mechanisms to pay for our transport system to the ones we currently have. And at the moment we have a, a fuel duty system and a road tax system, which are all controlled by central government. And I think that that probably isn't the right way to continue to fund infrastructure. And it was when our chair, George Osborne, was chancellor, he toyed with the concept of hypothecating transport taxation. So that's not a new concept. And as we see uh, road tax become less and less a source of revenue for government relative to its previous role, we see those uh, like I am, electric car vehicle drivers who don't contribute anything towards uh, often to the roads we drive on because we're not paying fuel duty. Um, you do need to reimagine anyway how we're going to pay for our infrastructure going forward, even if it's just on the road network. And I, that's why at Northern Powers Partnership, long before the kind of the recent kind of fad of people coming out for road user charging, have always taken a view and and from some of our early reports made the case for introducing those type of systems on a devolved basis quite quickly. Uh, and that's partly also about how we pay for the transformational change we need. So we are going to have to build new infrastructure still in the north of England in order to be able to have a growing economy and to decarbonise our economy at the same time. And that particularly means getting freight off our roads. So whether it's HS2 or Northern Powerhouse Rail, all these projects are predicated heavily on taking uh, significant numbers of lorries off our roads. Those projects also allow us to better utilise the local road space we have. So at the moment, lots of people are using cars in the north of England for journeys that in London South East are taken by public transport. And even with significant growth and active travel that many of our city regions like in Greater Manchester and the leadership of Chris Boardman have been pursuing, there's a lot more to do around pushing public transport use. And that means in Greater Manchester, the advanced development of their uh, B network in the form of bus re-regulation and a franchising approach to running services to improve bus connectivity. All of these things have to be paid for. And I suppose in the kind of era of the build up to the comprehensive spending review, I suppose I really want to make the case for the fact that decarbonisation and improvements to our transport network to underpin economic growth are not two separate agendas, right? So much of the, the, the North's debate about transport in the last decade has largely been about unlocking economic growth. But actually, if we're going to successfully decarbonise at the same time as we grow our economy, simply maintaining our current infrastructure and uh, merely putting in electric car charging points, for example, isn't going to get it done. Because you do have to make relative choices between what you spend your money on. And I think unlimited investment in the road network, even to enable decarbonised use of it, is not a practical approach to the north because the scale of the level of road building you would need is not something that will be judged to be ecologically sound or environmentally sustainable. And so certainly we at MPP are strong advocates for starting to think seriously about where the balance sits between road and rail investment, for instance. And in a world where we can't have both, that means we are gonna to need to constrain further big, bounds of, big rounds of road building beyond what's currently been agreed. But at the moment, Highways England is funded separately to network rail. There isn't a way to flex those budgets across between the Department for Transport. They're funded through silos and one of the natural outcomes, I would believe, of the transport plan that was developed by Martin's uh, predecessors and, and some of his forerunners at TFN is that the decisions around the prioritisation of the transport budget in the north of England need to be handed to northern leaders. And I would argue that's the same in other parts of the country, because we're going to have to start to make some serious decisions about what infrastructure we can genuinely afford and where our priorities and to invest really are. And... Uh, without that, we're not going to have the right type of transport network to be able to optimise and give people the choices they want going forward. And so it's, in the case of the north of England, not possible to see how we're going to decarbonise without significant rail investment. Without HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail, we will be dependent on uh, fossil fuel and largely 
uh, heavy goods vehicles for most of our freight and logistics needs for the foreseeable future because we just do not have enough capacity to do anything but that and that is the hardest thing to then decarbonize and i think what's been missed out i think from some of the mega infrastructure debates in this country is the idea that some of the large projects that have been developed were just around speed of getting to london for instance or uh, the need to be able to move more people across the pennines at peak times which still remains a significant problem for us if we're going to grow the economies of places like bradford that currently isn't on the heavy rail network in a meaningful way to be able to be accessible to other cities in the north never mind the rest of the country and so if we are going to be able to build the mass transit systems we need or improve them such as in west yorkshire where there's a strong aspiration to deliver mass transit that needs to be done alongside an honest conversation about where the money comes for those sorts of investments and in the north of england that means having a really open debate about how we raise the money to pay for infrastructure and any conversation about the future of infrastructure and the decarbonisation pathway that doesn't think about the funding methods for that whilst we sit in the burning platform that we are in fossil fuel terms hugely dependent on fossil fuel burning to pay for our current infrastructure needs and to pay into the general treasury pot from which we extract probably too little uh, value in terms of longer term infrastructure for transport investment if we're not going if we're going to be able to solve that challenge we absolutely need to talk about money not just about our priorities and this government hasn't been open enough, I don't think, with the public about the need for new approaches to fund transport infrastructure in this country and transport services. And to address Martin's polarity problem around the, the way in which fares are driving behaviours, we are going to need to have an open conversation with the public about how people pay to drive, particularly at peak times, journeys that they could easily do by public transport. Because in the end, for those people who choose not to use public transport at peak times to make journeys that could be made easily by public transport active travel, then those people should have to pay more for the, the privilege of doing that. And at the moment, we have a, a cost-based approach that doesn't allow that. So thanks so much, Hilary. Really lovely to have joined you and I really look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Henry. And I think you've brought us on to the, the really difficult issue about how do we pay for, for what we actually want in the future in terms of a decarbonised transport system. Um, road and rail trade-offs need to be made and, and somebody's already raised a question um, about the importance of, of joining up funding, not just focusing on, on, on capital, but also um, revenue funding is, is, is so important. So I hope we'll get into a bit more of that when we get to the uh, Q&A session. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to uh, Luke Murphy who is head of the Environmental Justice Commission and Associate Director for the Energy, Climate, Housing and Infrastructure team at, at the Institute for Public and Policy Research. Over to you, Luke. Thanks very much, Hilary. A rather long title uh, to uh, mouthful to, to, to get through. Um, yeah, well, thanks very much for uh, having me today. I wanted to talk a bit more broadly about the findings from the Cross-Party Environmental Justice Commission. The Commission was set up a couple of years ago uh, to, to look at not just how we decarbonise the economy and restore nature, but also to address wider economic and social inequalities. Um, and most relevant for, for today is that the Commission ran citizens' juries uh, across the country in places that are confronted with particular risks uh, and, up, and also opportunities in the face of accelerating action on climate and nature. Those places were Tees Valley and County Durham, the South Wales Valleys, Thurrock and Aberdeenshire. And they help shape uh, the uh, six shifts with which the Commission has argued needs to happen in how we approach decarbonising the economy uh, and also the development, as Claire mentioned uh, at the beginning, of a new social contract which the Commission proposed. Now, I hasten to add this, this contract is relevant uh, across, we believe, across all climate and nature policy, but also, uh, importantly, for, for transport as well, which I'll come to at the end. Uh, and the, the six shifts uh, that the Commission identified uh, that needed to occur were, firstly, that we need to move from just thinking about it as a problem to be mitigated. Uh, that's not to deny the overwhelming evidence and the impact it's going to have on all, all of our lives, but actually the people we heard from um, across the country recognised it as an opportunity to be seized as well. Secondly, that we need, need to move from fairness as an afterthought to fairness as a foundation. It's got to be central to the process. Thirdly, that we've got to move from the approach where it's being done to people uh, uh, to being done with and by people. Uh, fourth, that we've got to move from individuals and silos 
to a whole economy and all society approach. Uh, fifthly, uh, from top down policy, policy making to national leadership, but uh, local ownership and delivery. And finally, from climate alone to climate and nature together. And these six shifts uh, helped develop the social contract, again, which I mentioned, which I mentioned a moment ago, which I'm just going to take you through. First, the Commission proposes a people's dividend, a guarantee that people right across the country will benefit from the transition with the greatest return accruing to those who need it most. We know that done right, the benefits of ambitious action are substantial for both the public and the environment from the creation of decent jobs to lower energy bills and significant public health benefits. But policy does need to be purposefully designed to deliver these, deliver these benefits. They're not going to happen by chance. What we in the environmental movement often call the co-benefits, the people we spoke to in our juries just called the benefits, the jobs that are going to be created, the lower energy bills, as I mentioned. They want policies, including in transport, to focus on how it's going to improve access uh, to jobs, um, uh, and as a speaker said earlier, not just think about uh, the commute, but um, uh, the, the, you know, the creation of things like a 20 minute neighbourhood. Secondly, um, the Commission proposed a fairness lock on every climate and nature policy to ensure fairness is at the heart of everything that we do. As our jurors in South Wales Valley said, the cost of change, both financial and in how we live, have to be shared fairly. And this is something we heard time and again from our jurors across the country. That means that the cost of all policies must be fairly assessed. Uh, and as our previous speaker was just saying, that's going to be central when we're thinking about how we're going to pay for this. Those on the lowest incomes must not lose out. They must, in fact, benefit. For many of our jurors, they argued that this meant that support must be put in place ahead of change. And we must put in place mechanisms to ensure we're taking decisions, not just for now, but future generations as well. And that support must be put in place ahead of change, I think, is crucial for transport policy, because unless we are providing people with the low carbon alternatives to shift over as costs rise elsewhere, we are going to lose support for that transition. Thirdly, uh, we need a coordinated whole economy and all society approach to the transition. Our jurors argued that government needs to be joined up and every policy must be a climate and nature policy. But they want the government to also join forces with businesses, large and small trade unions and workers and the whole of civil society to tackle this challenge. Fourthly, uh, valuing what matters. I think what's really interesting, and this is really interesting for transport policy as well, is that the priority and the value that our jurors put on the preservation and restoration of and access to nature was hugely striking and the message was overwhelming. It's past time that we put nature on the same footing as climate. And this isn't something that's properly reflected in much of our national con conversation around net zero. Fifthly, uh, and most relevant for today, uh, this and the sixth shift, um, is that the Commission proposes a people first approach. We heard time and time again from our Jews that the public wants to be part of this transition. They want change brought about with or by them, not done to them. The Commission called for the public to have a clear role in the creation of climate and nature plans, including through permanent national citizens assemblies, access to clear accessible information they called for public communications campaigns from their local authorities national government and businesses uh, businesses too and finally uh, our jurors told us as our jurors told us in tees valley in county durham a one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to work we have to recognize that different areas of the uk have different challenges assets and opportunities so we must design policies with local circumstances in mind through passing powers down to combined and local authorities and local communities, because with this will achieve better and fairer outcomes. So the Commission calls for government to devolve far greater powers over the economy, transport and planning. In doing so, we've argued that local areas will be able to shape and deliver their own responses, allowing for more ambition, policy innovation, and also crucially, popular support. Just to conclude, the recommendations from the Commission cover everything from uh, including on transport from 20 minute neighbourhoods, targets to reduce car ownership and use, changes to transport appraisal, uh, local free or more affordable local public transport, the idea that all UK cities and towns should be supported to set ambitious targets to, re to reallocate road space to cycling. But what underpins all of these is the unifying idea that through action on climate and nature, there is an opportunity particularly in transport policy, to improve people's quality of life, to create new jobs and access to jobs, improve people's health and well-being, and increase, increase fairness. But central to delivering that 
will be devolution and pe putting people at the heart of the process. And I'll uh, stop there. I think I'm a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. And that was all really, really interesting. Um, we've got two more panel members now, and I would urge both of you to, to try and keep keep to five minutes so that we have plenty of time for, for discussion. So um, Gareth Powell, Managing Director of Surface Transport at Transport for London, please. Thank you, uh, Hilary, and uh, and it's great to be able to, uh, to talk to you uh, this morning. Um, so I wanted to share my thoughts, and I've, I'm conscious of your call to keep to time. Uh, I've got four things that, that spring to my mind uh, when talking about uh, decarbonisation uh, and localism. Uh, I think the first thing, and this reflects much of what's been said uh, already, uh, but it's about the importance of, of clear kind of targets, uh, clear unifying things that we can get around. Uh, all different partners in a local area can drive towards, and in London, uh, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan published his Mayor's Transport Strategy back in 2018 and at the heart of that transport strategy uh, is a target that 80% uh, of all trips uh, by 2041 uh, should be made by walking, cycling and public transport. And that target really brings and drives all of the different interventions uh, that not only Transport for London makes uh, but also our partners in the London boroughs uh, and elsewhere. And it's a very clear uh, ambition uh, that we can all work around when delivering all the multitude of different services uh, and things. And in one that, that has, you know, has stayed, had the test of time, but also has kept us clear all the way through the pandemic uh, and when we focus now uh, on the recovery. So over the last uh, 18 months or so, we've been able to, uh, working with the boroughs, produce some 89 kilometres of new or upgraded cycling infrastructure. Uh, 86 kilometres of bus lanes have been upgraded 24-7 operation and several thousand sets of traffic lights have been reviewed and changed with the single ambition uh, of improving uh, walking, cycling and public transport provision. And it's by bringing all of these different activities together, not only through a, a strategic authority like TfL, but also through local delivery partners that we're able to make uh, progress and to present the kind of choices for, uh, for, for local Londoners uh, and visitors to the capital, the sort of choices that we want them to make to be able to have a sustainable uh, set of transport trips and not resort uh, to using uh, the private car. The second area then that's really important alongside clear unifying targets uh, is the ability to integrate different policy areas to achieve uh, the same things. And uh, an example of that, we already in London, of course, operate the central London uh, congestion uh, charging zone uh, and the ultra low emission zone in central London. Uh, and at the end of next month, the end of October, we'll be expanding the ultra low emission zone uh, to the north and south circular roads uh, in London. And that area uh, is 18 times as big uh, as it is today, right in the centre of London. Now, that initiative is primarily focused on air quality. Uh, the most polluting vehicles will pay. Uh, those that don't pollute as much uh, won't. Uh, but of course, by doing so, the principle that those that are uh, in the worst offending vehicles are paying more, the money that comes from that can be recycled back into decarbonising uh, public transport in London and to provide those extra choices for people then to uh, be able to get out of their cars uh, and into other areas. So uh, that's an example where we can bring an air quality initiative to bear, uh, which also then the proceeds from which we can accelerate uh, our progress uh, towards our ultimate goal of 80% uh, of trips by 2041 being sustainable. It also means we can integrate with land use planning, uh, as, as Victoria was saying earlier, with the London plan, uh, really having influence on where things are developed, how they're developed, what the nature of those developments are, uh, and what the public transport provision should be to support those new developments so that they can start uh, in a more sustainable way. Which brings me on then to my third point, which is it's great to integrate policy, it's great to have targets, but actually you need to be able to influence the supply chain to be able to then deliver uh, against those policy ambitions. And in London, uh, as, as you will all know, we have a regulated uh, bus market. So we are able to incentivize uh, our private sector operators through our contracts uh, to be able to develop the public transport provision, particularly with buses, and to move quickly and at pace towards decarbonization. So already we're operating some 500 zero emission uh, bus vehicles in London out of a total fleet size uh, of 9,000. That means we've got probably the biggest uh, zero emission fleet in Europe. But the contracting mechanisms mean that we can spread that cost uh, over the lifetime uh, of the vehicles and of the contracts in London.
but also that we can incentivize that investment from the private sector by giving that clear uh, parameter. So that not, is not only uh, the bus manufacturers themselves, it's also other forms of investment from green finance coming through and also uh, ways of electrifying the bus depots themselves either from enhancing the grid infrastructure that goes into them uh, or by other third parties coming with kind of battery storage mechanisms and other things like that. And what we've seen is by setting very clear uh, goals in decarbonisation, it's not just benefiting London, but it's also meaning that the investment uh, that the bus companies are making, the innovation that's coming, will then be available to the bus industry nationally. That brings prices down, that makes the transition easier and quicker and much more efficient uh, for everybody. So the ability to invest in the supply chain alongside having clear policies that are integrated alongside clear overall targets is really important. But it brings to my fourth and, and final point, which is that the gains that all of those uh, can deliver can easily be, uh, be threatened uh, when you have a short term funding horizon. And as we all uh, sit in the start of a, uh, a comprehensive spending review, really, I guess the, 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 the kind of thought from me is that uh, if we're able to generate uh, sustainable funding over a multi-year period, then what happens is authorities are able, like TfL, to invest over the medium term to get those uh, really sustained shifts in, in, in behaviour that we want from people using transport, but also to make sure that the supply chains are able to invest and that that investment leads to cheaper prices uh, and more effective outcomes for everybody. So the short-term nature of funding leads to the opposite of those, where we wait and we don't invest and we don't make those changes quickly and long-term funding enables the efficiency to come uh, and enables uh, all of those using public transport to be able to make those trips with confidence because they know that the environment, the local environment, the regional environment is sustainably improving uh, and that therefore they can uh, take, the, take the, the, the leap to get rid of their car uh, and to become 100% walking, cycling, public transport user, which is of course uh, what we need to get back to that 80% target uh, that's been set for us uh, by 2041. So they're my thoughts, uh, Hilary, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and uh, there's already a, a very good debate being stimulated uh, in, in the Q&A section, which we'll come back to. I just want to hear now from our last panel member, uh, Jason Torrance, who's Assistant Chief Executive of UK 100. Jason. Hi, Hilary, thank you. And um, uh, as I'm the last person, and as we're running a bit late, you and others will be pleased to know, um, I've just got three uh, core points to make, and I'm going to be a lot less than five minutes. So, um, UK 100, we're, we're a network of local authority leaders uh, committed to going further and faster towards uh, net zero. And I just want to very briefly talk about uh, a, a report and investigation we did earlier this year that we produced called Power Shift, which essentially was the largest report into the powers needed by local authorities and what powers they have um, to move forward um, towards net zero. And particularly around transport, the, the core conclusion really uh, echoed, I think, by many of the previous speakers was that the decarbonisation of local transport networks is indeed being obstructed by centralised approaches to funding and decision making. And only by increasing devolution of transport funding and wider powers similar to London um, uh, and just echoing um, some comments made by Mayor Churchill, uh, it is only London where there is kind of full uh, devolution of the transport network. Um, so only by uh, in increasing devolution uh, of funding and wider powers will you uh, enable the coordination and delivery of transport networks that are appropriate for local areas and will get us towards um, net uh, zero. So I, I think there's, in, in our experience, there's three core areas uh, really. One, we have a, a lack of a coherent strategic direction at a national level. We, we have multiple directions being given to local authorities by central government. We have no framework in, in terms of net zero that supports a, a cohesive um, approach by local governments. Secondly, 
we, of course, as many people have talked about, we have uh, funding and resource constraints. Uh, of course, we know that we, uh, as a nation and and as a as a world, we're we're um, still paying um, catch up from the money that's had to be spent from from COVID, tackling COVID, and uh, there have been particular knock on effects for for local authorities. To compound things, local authorities have multiple and confusing funding pots provided by um, central government. The national framework that's problematic and as several speakers have talked about the national roads program uh, just over 27 billion certainly creates a a, a, a direction uh, and a focus now I, I i've been involved in um uh consultancy and uh advocacy campaigning uh, around transport for about 30 years now and i think the the it's true to say that the national roads program has always created a shadow uh, over everything uh, previously described by um governments as the largest program since the romans the largest since the 70s or most recently the largest ever this has got to end this has got to to shift to incentivizing sustainable alternatives to um car travel travel choices really for people particularly at, at a local level and while we have this very large national road building program um that's that's going to set the 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 future but of course, we do have some um, opportunities coming up. We we know, as several people have pointed towards, fuel duty um, has to change um, as we move away from petrol and, and diesel cars. And we have the opportunity with the UK Infrastructure Bank. So these both must prioritise uh, the move towards net zero. And then lastly, we we know and we have found with our our network that there are difficulties in engaging from local and combined authorities with uk government uh with regulators and and um organizations such as uh, dnos etc without having a um uh decentralized approach without having a framework that national government supports uh towards net zero uh those problems will will continue so i think at the moment we do have some significant problems uh on transport but i think looking towards the future uh decentralizing decision making uh and approaches to to funding provides lots of opportunity thank you thank you very much indeed jason and, and thank you um to all of our panellists. Um, so I'm now going to move on to hear some reflections uh, from uh, fellow members of the Greener Transport Council. So first of all, um, Anna Heaton, who's co-head of our transport sector and real estate partner, Adelshaw Goddard. Anna, please. Hi, thanks, Hilary. Um, I think that's been a, a really interesting um, series of um, presentations this morning, all looking at various different ways in which the role of localism um, in ensuring a transition to net zero has, a, has achieved certain things, but also the challenges that there are no doubt um, multiplying in, in various different local authorities and public authorities up and down the land. What, what's absolutely clear is there are no shortage of ideas. Um, but from my perspective as an advisor to many public sector bodies on particularly on regeneration and transport schemes, um, it, it's really important to think about how we can celebrate some great examples of what has already been achieved. So, you know, where there has been very strong devolution, we've seen what's possible in London. We've already heard from Gareth on that. Obviously, in places like Scotland, a very clear business plan, bringing in those policy um, and whole economy points um, alongside um, very ambitious net zero targets has achieved a lot. Also in Wales, I think the clear pipeline of projects, um, such as the new train fleets that's come forward there, has really meant that the private sector are able, able to be get involved earlier um, and to see where the opportunities were coming up. 
Um, and I think that's also an important way of addressing some of the funding issues that we've been hearing about. A central theme for me is that localism is a really important way to avoid those silos that everybody wants to steer clear of. Um, as Martin said, a whole systems approach is, is absolutely important. Um, localism integrating the planning framework that Victoria mentioned, making sure that Jamie's aims around um, considering the wider economic opportunity, but also um, factoring in the, the social needs and inclusion responsibilities of local leaders in each individual local place is absolutely important. Um, I think, you know, very close to Mayor Driscoll's area, we see in the Tees Valley how that levelling up agenda is really driving that whole economy approach to um, making sure that we're um, integrating the economic policy that needs to be driven, making sure that we're um, delivering on net zero objectives alongside transport objectives. And I think what, what Luke said about um, the um, Citizens Council saying that sustainability was not just a problem but an opportunity is something that I'd really like people to reflect on. We recently at AG did a, a survey of um, a few thousand businesses across Europe looking at their approach to sustainability and more transport companies than any other sector said that they saw sustainability as an opportunity and I think what really needs to be done is to harness that enthusiasm for that opportunity in a way that pays the right social contract so that those private sector companies that are getting involved are doing so in a way which um, increases the impact of their investment in terms of skills, jobs, long-term investment. And that only comes in turn from having certainty over um, long-term proposals. So the other theme I think that has been very strongly delivered this morning is national leadership um, and um, integrated plans and the power of local delivery. Um, certainly the, the network rail sustainability strategy that looks like um, a national plan was very much built up in the regions um, through a lot of stakeholder engagement. And I think that really detailed sense of national coordination, a long-term view on funding, and also addressing um, what we've heard from in terms of the, the frustrations in local authorities around the different funding pots, the changing directions, um, the lack of certainty. If we can get that right, um, if we can address some of the bigger, more difficult issues that Henry mentioned on the policy and political challenges, and then stick to our guns and allow our local leaders the freedom to deliver locally what's right for their areas, um, I think we do have some reasons to be optimistic, um, albeit that obviously the scale of the challenge is huge. Thanks, Hilary. Thanks very much indeed, Anna, for, for those reflections. Uh, and I'm going to um, move on now to Maria Manchenko, who is uh, Chief Executive of Midlands Connect. Over to you, Maria, please. Thank you, Hilary, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, what a great conversation. I, I'm trying to avoid the repetition uh, of the reflections, but uh, I will start perhaps with one area that we did cut a bit uh, first thing in the morning, which was our, our technology. You know, we cannot ignore that the public out there is waiting for a direction of travel confidence in what's the technology that's going to help all of us get to net zero. And in particularly in the Midlands, you can imagine this is a massive debate. Um, we, we are home to major global manufacturing firms and there's a huge um, sort of um, um, emphasis on how investing in the right technology could help the Midlands set up, set us as globally competitive in terms of the green jobs agenda, you know, think about hydrogen trains, we're also looking to planes and how we can make them um, uh, uh, operate better. Um, there's also massive manufacturers, you know, we've got Jaguar Land Rover, we've got Toyota, we've got, you know, a um, huge amount also of thinking around EV infrastructure, not just the cars, but the infrastructure and how you make them um, better. So technology and innovation, let's not under, undermine the importance of continuing to invest and provide that certainty in the direction of travel that then provides that confidence to the public that we are definitely in the right direction at scale, not just test beds, not just trialing. We actually, there's a clear direction of travel and that needs to come not only nationally, but also be driven locally too. Um, I also quite like the, the word, the, the use of the word transition. And again, that's something that if we need to think about the public, um, the public needs to understand what, what can they do now 
and what the tools are available now to make uh, the difference. I, I particularly like the challenge that Claire set to all of us right from the beginning that we really need to start um, being more creative and not just try to resolve the transport issue with the normal traditional transport methods. So we're going to have to do much more and be much more creative in terms of how we provide the right solutions now, the right alternative solutions now and accelerate that so we can actually also influence behaviours in a much more uh, positive way. You know, COVID has shown that if the public understands why we were restricted from some of our actions in terms of socialising, in terms of travelling and moving, we understood why we were told that was not the right thing. We kind of need to uh, find the ways of expressing equally convincing in a convincing manner and a sense of responsibility of what our actions means in terms of climate change when it comes to transport almost you know in the midlands we're even thinking about a, a carbon budget you know a personal carbon budget so as you move as you travel you get a feel and a feedback of actually how your decisions are shaping the overall carbon agenda in in the midlands and finally i could not emphasize more the, the issue of our funding and integrating wider, wider policy. You know, we, we were awaiting the planning um, paper uh, and also how you, you know, the tools that government are making available, like free ports, like the development corporations. What is the thought in there in terms of those strategic transport movements that will no doubt be driven by the free port proposals? So, um, so not only locally, locally is extremely important, and we, we are extremely committed to help our local partners to deliver locally. But we also, and I think one of the audience uh, make reference to this, we need to think also how the country moves strategically. Long journeys, um, the motorways, how many of those cars are with one passenger only and how we can just change those um, longer moving movements and longer sort of trips uh, and how we influence that behavior too. So, a lot to be done but i say we cannot and we really need to move on to our pace and now rather than just keep thinking about what would be the technology of the future that's something that a lot of our supply chains and our partners are telling us please stop the trialing culture that we don't know yet what's going to happen we're going to have to give ourselves some opportunity to explore things at scale to really work together and we need to work together across the midlands the north london Wales, um, there is a, a, an opportunity here to really make a difference rather than just focus on local. Um, so that's my reflections, but fantastic conversation, Hilary. Thank you very much indeed, Maria, and thank you for reminding us of our great capacity as a society for creativity and for using technology and innovation to, to move us forward when we're faced with such a challenging situation. Um, so I'm now going to move on to Kamal Panchel. Um, Kamal's senior advisor at the Local Government Association and certainly we've heard um, so much this morning already about the, um, the, the role of local authorities both from a planning and, and transport point of view so over to you please. Yeah thanks Hilary, yeah I've heard some great stuff and great reflections on the uh, uh, role of uh, local government of councils. Um, I just want to focus on sort of three um, key areas in terms of my reflections. Um, one perhaps where we I haven't heard so much on is around messaging um, and, and support for local leaders at a, at a national level. So um, we need to recognise that road space is, is generally fixed um, and councils are going to have to find um, different ways of reallocating that, that road space if we're going to deliver decarbonisation and, and modal shift. You know, extra cycling, we want to um, encourage more walking, um, bus prioritisation, we're talking about space for EV charge points, um, e-scooters, these are all actually, you know, some of these are actually new things to, to, to councils. And uh, um, what we want to see is actually um, that messaging, su supportive messaging from, from government. The decarbonisation plan is a very good uh, starting point for that. But even then we heard mixed messages around, you know, you can carry on what you're doing essentially. But actually the plan is saying the opposite. You, you can't really carry on what, what we're doing. Um, um, but we want to hear that clear messaging and support for local leaders because road reallocation is, as we all know, hugely contentious and there's going to be winners and losers with all, all, all these every time we, we, we shift that, that line in the road and we need government to back and give councils encouragement and incentives to make some very difficult political, political decisions. 
Um, second point is around um, incentivizing modal shift. So we know we can't rely on EVs to resolve our transport um, carbon emissions uh, challenges. Um, we will need a bigger proportion of journeys to be made by active travel, um, public transport, etc. So we think government should be thinking about incentivizing other sustainable transport means like they do for EVs and, and car use. Because um, the risk is that if we rely on EVs, it be EVs become so cheap that we actually increase car ownership and car use, which then crowds out um, use and investment in cycling, walking, public transport, etc. Uh, and we need those to make them commercially viable. Um, and then thirdly, it's really about funding and capacity. The point's been well made, um, but it's not just the, and we're not talking about just quantum of funding. We've got plenty of capital out there, actually. It's, it's really around the nature of that funding. So having that long-term funding certainty as, Highways England enjoys, as, as the uh, rail network enjoys, but also increasingly now the, the Merrill Combined Authority areas enjoy. So it doesn't make sense that we plan, uh, that, that the funding is organised in a different way for the rest of the country. After all, it's one big network that we're talking about, I think, in the country. So uh, we need to, to have a, a, a rethink about that. And critically, let's not forget about um, you know, resourcing and, and, and bums on seat. We need expertise within councils to do some of these, these things that are in the, in the plan. Um, we, if we're going to be effective partners with government on delivering the, the transport decarbonisation plan and all the things that are in there, we need, we need resources to, to do that. We need people to understand um, you know, the, the commercial marketplace in terms of EVs, but also around um, buses, around designing good um, cycling schemes, etc. And the problem is it's just too much variability across um, councils at the moment. So um, we, we really need to need some support around um, sort of revenue support so we can get the right bombs on, on seat. I've got a lot more uh, uh, other points, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, uh, leave for, for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think uh, I think you've probably uh, raised quite a controversial issue about is there actually enough capital funding around? But we, we, we will come back to that because I want to hear now from Paul Campion, who is Chief Executive of TRL. Thanks, Hilary. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's spoken so far. Uh, as always with these events, a really, uh, really impressive set of comments and um, very difficult actually to think of anything uh, uh, worthwhile to add to us. But we've heard about the importance of diversity, which is, which is central, of fairness which is fundamental. Um, and then, as it were, a whole raft of detailed challenges, issues, solutions, some small, some large. Uh, the, the thing here is that we are talking about a change in society, a change in the way we live, a change in the economy. And several people have said, well, there isn't a solution which just enables us to carry on as we are, but we magically swap out internal combustion engines for electric engines and everything's okay. That, that isn't actually an answer. But I don't know that we've really grappled with the implications of that, which are that we have to find different ways of, of living. We're not gonna succeed with a, a message of, we're gonna take away your car, or success is somehow to, force you to walk and to cycle. Not that I'm suggesting that anyone thinks that forcing anyone to do anything is the right thing, but message sent is not always the same as message received. And I fear that our passion, and I speak about it because I think that everyone speaking here and everyone listening today probably shares a passion, a sense of urgency, uh, a belief that we have to do something fundamental, we have to do it rapidly. The issue of pace has been raised up, uh, before. We have to do something now. And as we talk, therefore, about the things we need to do, we talk in imperatives. We must do that. We have to do the other. And this is simultaneously true and perhaps not the right language to be using to bring people with us. And I think there's a, there's a real challenge here, isn't there? If we are perceived as having religion on this subject, as being unable to listen to the concerns or the challenges of people who perhaps 
haven't yet internalized the urgency of this, who are very consumed with the day-to-day -day challenges of getting through life. And you know, a, a Jamie talked about this, he's not the only person who did, but you know, we, we're dealing with the real detailed reality of people's lives. And um, not everyone has the, uh, the position, the, 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 the level of comfort that I have, or, or, or maybe you have, uh, they are very focused on getting through the day um, and are looking for someone else to help them to understand what they need to do. They haven't got the space, the time, the effort to make the extra effort to think about how they do everything they do and do it in a decarbonised way. So we sort of get this, this challenge, don't we, which was we've got, we've got a real uh, potential um, conflict between democracy and speed. And I, for one, don't want to compromise on our part, either of those. And we haven't really used the phrase placemaking, although we've talked about the 15 minute, the 20 minute city, maybe we'll go 17 and a half minute city and split the difference. Uh, placemaking, I'm wondering whether we actually we need to talk about life making. How are, we, how are we together going to build better ways of living that are decolonized. And has just been raised, the point about skills, perhaps that's the central fundamental skill. Yes, uh, I think we can see that local government at various levels has perhaps been um, de-skilled through, uh, you know, through cuts over, over many years. Perhaps they don't feel they have the technical skills needed to understand the future possibilities in transport and apply them across the region. But maybe there's an even more fundamental skill, uh, which we can never have enough of, um, which is the skill to bring people with us to tell the stories, to help the uh, 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 people to understand that there are ways to rapidly make changes that will lead to a better life, better here defined as uh, at least as um, uh, able to have people flourish and contribute uh, in, in various ways to society and reduce the impact on the environment. So uh, where does that leave us? I don't know, that's, that's perhaps maybe an even more of a bigger problem. Um, but uh, this has to be done locally, doesn't it? And maybe the, the, uh, the action point is to recognise that um, for all that we uh, locally need help from central government uh, in many, many areas, um, policy, yes, uh, the way that accounting is done so that we can um, uh, prioritize correctly, uh, the right price signals, the ability to show people the real costs in the round of the decisions they make, all these things are probably central only. But what we can do at a local level is to help central government to understand that the country is ready for those changes because central government particularly uh, is very sensitive to the fact that it can only lead as fast as people are willing to follow. And so there perhaps is the call to action. What can local authorities at all levels do? Well, articulate a case for support from central government that shows that they, local, uh, local authorities, they, the people, are ahead of where central government is. And central government can safely lead, confident that people will follow. Don't want to overuse, overuse my time, Harry. So, uh, um, to the extent that uh, I've got anything to say, that's it. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. And can I ask now all the panelists and members of the council to put their um, videos on, please, so that we can move into uh, a wider discussion? Great to see you all. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going, there's been some really interesting questions um, coming up. Um, in the Q&A. So I'm going to pick on one from uh, Graham Pendlebury, who many of you will know, a former colleague of mine at the Department for Transport. Um, and Graham's question has also been echo echoed by other, other people. I mean, Professor Michael Corcoran uh, as well has raised this issue. And Graham says, um, I'm not hearing much about significantly reducing the total amount of movement in the UK. Um, so you know, building HS2, mode shift for freight, London style public transport. Um, Graham says this feels as though we're skirting the issue. Um, they're all worthwhile actions, but a long way from the fundamental shift required to achieve net zero. So who amongst the panel would like to, uh, um, would, would like to uh, answer Graham's question? Who 
Henry, please. So I think the kind of the, the economic and, and social challenge here is that the, this all comes in the context of the government's wider approach to levelling up, right? So you've got uh, the need to redistribute economic activity around the country in a different way at the same time as you decarbonise. And so it's a bit like the argument about uh, we already produce all the emissions in this country um, and we need to then go further to be able to change our lifestyles because other people are, are naturally in other parts of the world going to want to potentially consume some carbon and, and they're not going to be able to maybe decarbonise quite as quickly. And I would make the same argument, which is that it's very hard to imagine how people are going to stop uh, driving everywhere in places that don't have decent public transport. Um, and I think that there is a wider challenge, which is that uh, we don't want necessarily to be entirely dependent on electric vehicles as part of our decarbonisation journey, because it's an inherently, as has been said, if, if private car use, but simply electric car use becomes the default model of decarbonisation, then we have very congested cities that just can have marginally better air quality. And that's not the right answer to our challenge. So I think from the perspective of being perhaps a little challenging to colleagues who may have been at the department in the past, uh, Hillary, uh, with all the, the, the due respect and regard, we have a transport system that has seen significant underinvestment in most of England, other than London and the South East in the last 50 years. And that's a legacy the department has to live with, I'm afraid. And so if you're trying to decarbonise public transport and wider modes of transport across the country, at the same time as you're also having to invest in historical gaps in, in service provision and in, 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 and in infrastructure that enables people to get around, that produces a complicated mix. And I think it's why clearly in those places that have better public transport, you're seeing a greater focus on active travel first because there's more opportunity to push active travel in places that have a decent public transport network because you're working in the context of people who already have choices. If people don't even have access to a decent bus service, it's quite hard to see how they're going to, if they can't afford an electric vehicle, be able to cut their contribution to emissions in any time soon. And I think I would, I would suggest that to talk about decarbonisation outside the context of dealing with historical inequalities in the country is not going to get you very far because those people who have been the economic losers of being in places that have been left behind and cut off are not going to react well to being told that transport uh, usage needs to stay locked based on its previous allocation historically and those biases in transport investment need to stay continually because now we need to focus on decarbonisation. It just isn't a credible approach. So what we need to do is, in places where we're investing more in transport, accelerate the switch. That's why I was, suppose I was alluding to the fact that I'd be quite happy to see quite dramatic cuts, which has also been discussed in the chat, to the roads budget in the north of England, if I could, if I could actually reallocate that money directly to other modes but the Department for Transport doesn't currently allow that. So some of the bolder things that those like Martin could be encouraged to do, right, in some national transport bodies, those like Maria, they're not allowed to do because they can't control the balance between the Highways England and the network rail budget. Give places the ability to do that, and we can start to say we don't want roads. But as long as we're only being given roads and not the rail investment we need, then don't blame those people who run some national transport bodies that they're building more roads and they're encouraging building more roads because they haven't got a choice. Because if they need more mobility and better better frequency and better reliability, they aren't being given the choices to prioritise that investment. Unfortunately, central government is still doing that from the centre and the Treasury still likes to build roads. And that's the person I'm afraid those who don't like that in the session are going to have to take it up with. Thanks very much, Henry. Some provocative uh, comments there. And, and just in case there's anybody uh, in the audience from Highways England, I understand they've rebranded themselves. They're now called National Highways. <laughs> um, and I'm going to bring in Jason and then Paul and then Martin, please. Jason. Hi, thank you, Hilary. Yeah, I, I, I think Henry uh, brings up a really important word here, which I think must underpin uh, any, any kind of reduction in travel or reduction in traffic that undoubtedly we need. Uh, and that word is choice. I, I think if you look back to uh, work that was taken forward in Manchester in 2008 around proposed congestion charging, or indeed by central government around national road pricing, um, you know, people essentially don't uh, like being told what to do without an alternative. And I think uh, local and national governments need to work hand in hand 
um, uh, around uh, a presentation of choice so that things like uh, video conferencing or alternatives to car travel become the, the natural choice. So I think uh, critical uh, going forward, but we, we will fail if we say just simply to people, you must stop doing something without an alternative. Thanks, Jason. Um, Paul, please. Yeah, I completely agree with what Jason says. You know, we've got to tell positive stories. Um, the, the and I, you know, I, I absolutely what Henry says resonates. Um, we don't want to pick a fight with him though. But but I do think we need to think about again the way the future is going to be different from the past. So refighting a battle which has been lost over many decades for. Uh, uh, infrastructure investment or, or uh, investment in um, historical modes of travel uh, may not be the right way forward. It, it's, been a, it's been a consistent bugbear of mine that cycling is promoted in this country with bloody lycra, excuse my language. Uh, I, I'm sorry to use the L word, uh, but, um, but it's always about the fit, fitness benefits. Anyone who wants to cycle for fitness has been doing so long, long ago, and it tends to play to the thousand pound carbon bike uh, um, weekend brigade instead of cycling as a cheap and effective means of local transport. Never mind cycling. What about e-scooters? What about e-bikes? There's a whole set of, of, in a sense, underutilized modes, which for relatively much less infrastructure investment can open up the possibilities of people's lives. And if we say that the only thing that people can aspire to is to get stuck in traffic in a ton and a half of metal in the way that was aspirational in 1970, then I'm afraid we are not going to solve the problem. We have to find different stories that are positive uh, uh, and play to, a, to a, uh, um, a decarbonized agenda. To be clear here, I'm not for a second saying that I wouldn't welcome a readjustment in the way that uh, infrastructure investment is done. Um, I think the, the um, uh, equity uh, uh, argument is extraordinarily important, particularly, by the way, go back to what Jamie said, in diversity, right? You know, there's, 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 never mind North versus South, there's a female versus male uh, um, uh, unbalance in um, the way that transport provision is done, and we can probably think of many, many more. So yes, that is absolutely fundamental. Yes, of course, I strongly suggest that, but, and we have to find new ways of providing new solutions that are better for people and better for the environment. Thanks, Paul. Martin. So for me, we've got as a profession, this is where there's a real challenge for us as professions. We, we uh, uh, aspire to be leaders in this conversation. So we've got to get better at using the knowledge and the skills we've got to actually, first of all, better define the questions and then use our knowledge experience to get to better solutions. What do I mean by that? It comes back to being really clear about why do people need to travel, first and foremost. And it's not about using better ways of um, capturing how many people are on a piece of road at any one time using mobile phones or whatever the technology is. Why are they traveling? And and have there are there opportunities to uh, to change the, the reason for travel. Rather than having to travel 50 miles to the next uh, city, can we help uh, improve the, uh, the urban environment where they live so they can travel two or three miles rather than that 50 miles? This is why I say we need to understand the user, but we also need a systems approach. And, and what reflects on me, uh, what reflections I draw from the recent pandemic is, it's reinforced in my mind that the fundamental assumptions underpinning much of our work today are wrong. We assume when we're looking at transport investment that more economic growth inevitably leads to more movement on the scale that we see in London and the Southeast. And, and actually, that's not what people are aspiring. Why is it that we assume people will have to travel, want to travel that kind of distance? Comes back to the importance of looking at placemaking, outcome focus. And I think as a profession, we're too timid sometimes. We're too timid to understand how you can change the need to travel quite rapidly. I can go back over my career and look at instances where government has changed the policy. For example, an out-of-town 
um, uh, entertainment centers. And within, and within about 18 months, two years, you saw the industry react to it very quickly. You saw that kind of investment coming into the urban areas, revitalizing town centers in the evening, and actually fundamentally shifting some of the activities. It's a systems approach. It's putting the user at the heart of it. And it's being really clear about what do we need transport to do to achieve those outcomes rather than how do we mitigate the impact of our transport choices. We've got to get better at thinking about this in terms of outcomes and people and treating it as a program. And that's what we're trying to do through TFN, where our whole approach to the investment pipeline is as a program. So we have an opportunity to think in those ways. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, Luke, please. Thanks. I just want to add very briefly that actually, uh, I mean, I agree with uh, everything that's been said and the, the work that we did holding the citizens' juries across the country, kind of we tried to get underneath actually what, what users want from public transport, uh, from, from, from the future of transport. And actually one of the most interesting areas we held a jury was in the South Wales Valley. It's an area that isn't well known for being served by uh, public transport, where I think there, there would be assumption uh, that actually uh, that, that they want to see a big emphasis on electric vehicles and, and, and very little else. Actually, they kind of promoted more than anything the idea that, um, that there was a line in the, the, the final commission's report that everyone should be able to live a good life without having to own a car. Um, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to it. And I thought one of the most powerful things they said was, uh, just a quote from them was electric is only part of the answer we also need fewer car trips overall so a move to electric vehicles must only happen in combination with public transport improvements and a reduction in journeys actually they know you know they have a very good uh, holistic uh, view of what they want from transport in their area and we need to we need to focus more as others have said on the, on the users and the kind of outcomes that they want to, the kind of outcomes that they want to see. But going back to what Jason said, choice is fundamental because literally nobody would have been happy uh, in that jury if choices were forced upon, you know, they want to see the alternatives and then they can see a future where they don't need to own their car. And indeed they don't want to have to rely on their car to get everywhere, but they do need those alternatives and choices uh, put in place. Thanks very much, Luke. That, I think that's a, that, that's a really good point, um, well made. Now there's questions specifically aimed at Jamie, although I'm very happy for others to come in, about e-scooters. Uh, and the question is, um, what is your view on the role of e-scooters? Something that people are keen on using, but something that uh, many lo local authorities are worried about from a safety perspective. Jamie. Thanks, Hilary. Yeah, I saw that in the, uh, the Q&A. Um... <clears throat> The trial that's going on in Newcastle at the moment is primarily in the inner city areas, um, but these are very much student areas and, uh, and you require a driving license, you've got to drive it on the road. Um, you can also use it on some uh, cycleways, or people do, I'm not sure what the legal situation is. Um, the problem with that is it's a, a network solution rather than an individual solution, um, and it's not available to a lot of people so if you're going to be driving down the road on an e-scooter up against a car or you know a bus or a van going past you there's only one outcome in any collision so yeah it is inherently unsafe um, so when we're talking about the redesign of road space and additional spaces and in certainly in most places there's lots of opportunity for additional routes what e-scooters open up is the ability to get something that's it's not fully active travel, but it's slightly more active travel for those who are substantially less active people. Um, and it uses very little space. They're fairly cheap. Um, if they were to become licensed in the UK, you'd be able to get one that you can carry, weighs you know, the amount that most people quite comfortably carry, take it to work, plug it in, uh, take it back, get on the bus, get on the, the metro and use it at the other end. I see that as the long-term solution. Um, and uh, if you're doing it, okay, there's there's some, you can geofence these things easily enough so that if you're going down, you know, Sumberland Street in Newcastle, you're not getting people dodging, which is unsafe. Um, I'm not sure how many people will be killed by that, but, you know, an accident is an accident. And uh, Ian, you can get them so they just don't work in those spaces or they go very, very slowly. 
Um, I think that is where we should be going with a lot of these technologies. And then when you know it's your e-scooter, you don't worry about, is the one available for me when I go out for work? You're not going to make a modal shift. What people want from transport above all else is certainty. I know when I'm going to get there and I'll adjust my timetable. It's something that, that humans have done as long as we've had um, people moving around. Thanks very much, Jamie. Does anybody else want to come in on the e-scooter point? Um, Paul. Uh, sorry, tell me hello if I'm talking too much, but I, I, I've been on Jamie's e-scooters uh, in uh, Newcastle and um, uh, similar ones in a couple of other places. Um, and I agree with everything he says, by the way. Uh, I think that they've got a real place to, to a real place in a uh, in an end-to-end -end journey. Um, my observation would be the infrastructure required to support them um is relatively cheap compared to RIS2. And it's a great example where where in this case there is enough capital because there's a ton of sort of infrastructure money sloshing around. But rather than you know dueling the A10 or you know doing a bypass or something, you know, if what you do is you create some more secure storage uh where these things can be locked up so you've got some confidence if you leave it on the street will come back. Same applies to bicycles. If there can be a bit of um hard separation uh jamie i completely agree i you know with a um, i've completely trusted the um the newcastle bus driver behind me um but i was pretty conscious that if i fell off then it might be difficult for him not to squash me um uh, it, you know the, the, there's a basic separation requirement here probably to uh, give people the confidence to use this in volume that stuff's cheap, though, actually, compared to the sorts of, of infrastructure money that is that is still available in the system. Um, uh, what it requires is a bit of help from upstairs to, to, to create some licensing and then a bit of creativity and imagine, imagination at the local level to just turn this into a, a, a genuine part of people's end to end journeys. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and now I want to turn to the question that, that really came up quite a lot throughout the discussion um, around uh, funding and financial allocations. And um, Tony Plum uh, raised this issue. How can we get away from financial allocations being nearly always for capital expenditure and not recurrent, such that most influencing behaviour action is denied funding? And then he also talks about uh, the current process of competitive bidding for pots of money um, being not joined up, sporadic um, and unhelpful. So would anybody like to comment on the funding situation and how we can change it? Kamal, please. Yeah, it probably wouldn't surprise you that we, we put my hand forward on this. Um, yeah, I raised the point earlier in my reflections that um, the funding is is all wrong, and I completely agree with the with the, with the questioner on that. That um, um, it needs to be much more long term, at least in line with um, other transport modes, and what we're now start or the mayoral combined authority areas are now starting to see. Um, it's just having that certainty just allows you to to, to plan. Um, plan more effectively, plan for the uh, sort of, I guess, better solutions, longer term solutions, give you the space to take people with you, do the, uh, the engagement, bring in third parties, leveraging um, third party investment as, as, as well. Um, and it, it just it just makes a whole lot of sense to, to do that. And it sometimes just surprises me how, how difficult um, um, that is found in, in, in government. Um, the other thing I've made the point also around resources and, and um, you know, we do need um, uh, enough resources to spend that money well, that, that capital money well. And I think that we, we're not in a position where we, we've, we've got that, or at least not, not it's not, um, there's no minimum level across local government here. There's people, um, councils are in very different places. Um, the other thing that um, I'd personally like to see more of is more councils um, coming forward with um, other income generating schemes. So they've got their own certainty. If they can't rely on government, have their own certainty. So I'd like to see more, you know, workplace parking levy um, places come, come forward. We still only have Nottingham. Uh, I know others are, are, are um, considering this. Um, and we have actually got the ability to raise our own congestion. We don't have to go uh, congestion charging schemes. We do not have to go to uh, the Secretary of State for sign off on, on those. But as far as I know, there's, there's, there's only um, um, 
in, in Durham, I think some small scheme there. I know it's very difficult, um, but this is where it goes back to having sort of some central government support for uh, lo local ideas and 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 um, to do things a bit differently and to use existing legislation where we've where we've we've got this. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kamal. Um, Jamie, did you want to come back in? Thank you. Uh, very brief because of time. We have a conceptual problem that we think of capital as investment and revenue as spending. And you get frequently much better returns from investing in revenue. Um, so that, that's a point. I see lots of nods. So I'll let everybody else develop the point. Secondly, um, Kamal's absolutely right about the need for long-term spending. I, I don't think even that's remotely controversial. It's just it doesn't happen. That's simply a question of political will and Whitehall letting go um, and the Treasury actually trusting other areas. And that's where it comes down to. It's a political decision. And some of this requires fiscal innovations. So it's there's any numbers of ways in which a local authority, a combined authority, can raise the money. The question is, what are the mechanisms by which we can pay it back? Because we create benefits and other people accrue them. So that's what needs to happen, the closing of the loop. And that's the advantage of something approaching total place. So I was mentioning earlier, if we're talking about the vast sums of money we're spending on fixing ill health, we were to have a framework agreement in place where we can say, if we can demonstrate that our actions are reducing that, can we have that saving, please? It would give us the ability to borrow up front at fairly low rates at the moment. And then when those investments were in place and shown to be working, we would have the revenue to pay it back. We know what's needed in our areas. We can join it up in a way that you just can't possibly do from Whitehall. So that's really where central government needs to fix it. You cannot level up with concrete. Thank you. Um, Martin, a very brief comment, please, because we're nearing the end of the, of the session now. The two quick things. What is um, having that funding clarity uh, if you have that, uh, whether it's at a subnational transport level or a local authority level, allows people to properly prioritise. And engineers are great at being able to design solutions, but you need to have a sense of what is it you're trying to prioritise within. That's where we uh, where we fall down. Um, and if we have that clarity, I think we can make some progress. The other thing is we should just challenge ourselves. The question was about the the cost of the. Uh, process of bidding for competitive funding if we actually worked out the overhead we load onto the system of all the competitive processes the 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 time the money the resources spent uh, and you don't have to do it probably once it's probably two or three times for that same project until you get lucky but then you have all the mate the reporting processes if we treated this as a proper uh, sort of a cost benefit perspective we would look to minimize the overhead, we would have clear budgets on our long-term framework and then allow people to deliver within a programme. Thank you. Jason, a very quick comment and then, then Anna. Yeah, please. thank you. Just two very brief points. Uh, I think uh, Jamie is absolutely right. Uh, investment is critical, um, but uh, national government support to enable um, local authorities to come up with a business case where money can be paid back is is absolutely critical will be the difference between success and failure on this so i think investment and funding are critical if we if we really do believe we're in an emergency with climate we need to be focusing all of our funding and all of our investment efforts i think around um uh, around climate uh, and then the the last point, I, I think we we've got to move away from this ridiculous situation as identified by the National Audit Office in their recent report, where they identified twenty one dedicated grant schemes offered by central government to local authorities. Some local authorities would be good at finding where the money is. Many will not. Uh, uh, but it's a headache, of course, for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> And Anna, just a quick last word from you, please. Sure. Um, just to say that hopefully with certainty of funding, there'll be more involvement of the private sector who really do see this as an opportunity. And there's a huge amount of capital out there ready to invest. I know Jason made that point earlier. Um, I do think it's important to reflect on the fact that 
for a lot of investment funds and for banks. Um, there's a huge premium on investing in net carbon zero projects and they will not be investing in borrowers who don't sort this out. So there's a huge commercial imperative to getting this right as well. And if we can bring them in earlier with that greater certainty of funding, then I think the, the results of what that public sector funding can deliver will be so much greater. Thank you very much, Anna, and great, a great note um, to, to end on. Well, thank you all very much um, for our, our panellists today, our council members, everybody that's been listening and contributing uh, to, to the webinar uh, and, and our, our, our sponsors and supporters. I think it's been another really great discussion. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to sum up all the many, many uh, ideas that we that we heard today. Um, I think what really comes across to me is that you know we've, we, we've all collectively got to start focusing on how to implement practically some of the things that we, we know we all want to do around uh, decarbonisation. Um, I think an integrated uh, strategic ap approach to planning is absolutely essential. Um, we need to work collaboratively across the public and private sectors and we need uh, incentives to change our behaviour but they need to be inclusive uh, in the way they're implemented. So thank you all very much indeed and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you.